Okay, uh, this is Athens Speak Out. This, the topic is called uh, The Consequences of Donald Trump's Electoral Victory on the United States Foreign Policy, Part 2. And this is Athens Speak Out, number 392. And our moderator is Steve Antel, who's going to keep the clock, and every two minutes he alternates the questions. But first, I'm going to give a slight introduction of what we did last time. Last time, we discussed the, in detail the American victory against Adolf Hitler, Benito Mussolini, and the Japanese Empire in World War II. I doubt if Truman has sufficient understanding of history to have a clear idea of how to run the State Department. Hillary Clinton. Uh, Robert, can I make a correction? You yeah. said Truman. I think you want to say Trump. I'm talking about Trump now. Yeah, but you did say Truman. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you for that. I doubt if Trump has sufficient understanding of history to have a clear idea of how to run the State Department. And Hillary Clinton is also rather weak in understanding foreign policy, despite her Wellesley College education. Unfortunately, it was in political science and not in history. And it was at least better than Trump's experience as a real estate dealer. Okay, uh, we're going to ask uh, Trump yeah, a I'll question. Go with, uh, David I mean, David. Wit. Yeah, Dave DeWitt. Do, uh, David, do you have any further comments on why Trump won and why Hillary lost? Um, oh, geez. I, I don't have any new analysis as far as uh -huh. why he won. With every passing day, it becomes more and more baffling that anybody thought he would be qualified for this position. Okay. Okay, well, let's go right over to Robert now, ask the okay. same question. Why do you think Trump won and Hillary lost? Okay, well, I discovered a new assistant professor by the name of Oka Elliott, assistant professor of history at Misericordia, Misericordia University in Dallas, Pennsylvania, a rather new school. And Dallas, Pennsylvania is a very obscure town. Anyway, uh, he's only an assistant professor, a very young man. And he has added to the underestimation of the Roman Catholic bloc in elections since the 1950s. And Trump won a majority of the Catholic voters and on the abortion issue and on the birth control issue. And it seems to have had been decisive in allowing the Trump-Pence ticket to win a majority of the Catholic voters in the primary. Eliot himself is a Catholic and illustrates how the Catholic Church has been slowly gaining considerable influence since the 1950s. Hillary Clinton, the New York Times, the Washington Post, as optimists, should not have been surprised. Up to the 2016 election, there have been seven Catholic vice presidential candidates in either the Republican or the Democratic parties, including the 2016. Both. Both of them this year, correct? They're both of them this year, right. I have a question for you, Robert, before right. you go on. Uh, you're saying that, you know, that, that Trump got the Catholic vote. Majority. The majority. He, he didn't get them okay. all. Okay, was there a breakdown as far as the Catholic men and Catholic women, or do yeah, Catholic they, women tend to vote with their husbands, or yeah, how's that Yeah, the Catholic go? women, that's the big surprise. Everybody thought that Trump would do well with with Protestant and Catholic men, male chauvinists. That was his big constituency. Yeah. The surprise was, the surprise to Hillary was, that Trump won 
a majority, I think it was 53%, of the older Catholic women above the age of 35, especially if they had children. Yeah. And Trump then used his Presbyterian background to win from the feminist Hillary Clinton. That's my point. And that was uh, uh, Professor Elliott's point. Okay. Okay. I have another question. How did you discover P Professor Elliott? You mentioned last week about him. Yeah. But, uh, well, I, I read it on, on the Internet. On the Internet, okay. Yeah, I, okay. I get a, a special newsletter on, uh, on history. Okay. I belong to a H, HNN, the History News uh, uh, Channel. Okay. 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 And he has about, oh, he has 15 articles every week written by historians, and they go all over the map. They talk about the history of Rome and the history of the Catholic Church, the history of... Is this school in Dallas, Pennsylvania, is that a private school or...? It's a, it's a new school, I guess it's private. Okay. And I didn't know anything about it, but, yeah. but he wrote a little essay about it. And, and the HNN republished it, okay? And without HNN, nobody would have ever heard of him, mm -hmm. okay? And he doesn't have any publicity in the... New York Times or the Washington Post and the mainstream media. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so anyway, up to the to, to, we have had seven Catholic vice presidential candidates in either the Democratic or Republican parties, including the 2016 election. Now, Dave Dewitt and I had a dispute. We did, did discuss this last time on the meaning of social issues on the last show. And I think there are many social issues in the debate. The class struggle, A. B, the race conflict. C, the immigration conflict. And D, the longstanding national debt and financial crisis. And neither candidate, neither uh, Trump nor Hillary, <clears throat> were debating this in the primary. Okay, Robert, I'm gonna have uh David respond to that and then what I would like the next question to be for you uh, Robert is yeah. to elaborate on those points that you okay. just mentioned okay good um, yes well yeah last program um, we did talk about social issues you've expanded the definition there uh, in your last comment beyond what I, I think I was intending in last program I think that the issues that were most uh, from my perspective, the issues that voters were really concerned about this election, from what I've, I've seen from exit polling and whatnot, were uh, twofold. Uh, uh, there are, uh, the economy always kind of tops the list, and I'm not talking about the national economy, the, the stocks and whatnot. I'm talking about people's everyday lives, wage stagnation, things like that. And I think the other thing that was important to people were, was uh, this kind of uh, feeling against the um, the current people running the government so they were it was a protest vote a vote for change um, as it were uh, so I think those were the main things on people's minds but when we talked last week when we were referring to social issues I think uh, we were referring to the LGBTQ community and things like that and I just don't think that was foremost on people's minds this cycle I think there were other issues that were more generally important to voters so that's my response. Okay. Oh, you want to elaborate yeah. on those points? Well, well uh, I say that as a political historian, we have to have statistics, not impressions. And both Mark Shields, who's on uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting TV, and this new professor, Oka Elliott, thought that Hillary Clinton had a poor campaign as a wishy-washy Methodist, which did not go over well with married women and especially those women with children. So our dispute is on the nature of the sexuality question. Sexuality was exaggerated by both Hillary and Trump and I, as an old-fashioned Puritan, uh, who was raised by a Methodist mother, wouldn't discuss those things publicly. Right. 
And I agree with Hillary, with Bill Clinton, who said, don't ask, don't tell. Yeah. Well, the LBGT wants to tell everybody about their private lives. And I think that's nobody's business. Well, that's where, that's where uh, uh, Dave and I have had some disagreements. So I don't know whether David wants to continue that or whether we want to... I, I don't think it was a, a disagreement. I think it was a misunderstanding. Is what misunderstanding. I it yeah. Well, I forgot the name of Shields. That was my problem. Yeah, we couldn't... You know, David, or, um, Mark Shields and sometimes you mentioned Brooks, David I mean, Brooks. David, David Brooks, Brooks is his opponent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now... Uh, now you see, say now you know I used to watch Brooks and Shields years ago uh, on PBS, right? And uh, you know they had opposing points of view. That's whereas right. now you say they're pretty much aligned with That's one another. True. That's then, right. Uh, Brooks was originally a supposedly a a liberal Jew from upper class up 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 town New York, right? And he's largely literary rather than historical. Well, uh, he's become more liberal. That is, he's become, as a Jew, more liberal, more tolerant of the Christian way of thinking. Yeah. And I heard him on uh, Diane Rehm. And Diane Rehm said, well, you're a very civilized person because you're quoting uh, novelists from the 19th century. You're quoting uh, Hawthorne. You're quoting... Uh, Moby Dick, you're qu quoting when the Protestants were very, very dominant in 19th century America. And only with John Kennedy do we get any uh, Catholic president. And we still only have had one Catholic president. Well, yeah, he goes all the way. Okay, you mentioned Nathaniel Hawthorne. Hawthorne right. and, and, and also, I think, Henry David Thoreau. That's is, right. You know, That's right. Uh, some of those people. They is, have a moral point of view, uh, and it tends to be Ralph right. Waldo Emerson and the transcendentalists. Yeah. yeah, 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 right, right. So that's how we got into this uh, religious dispute. Okay. How how far are you going to be tolerant? Tolerance is the key word, and these candidates do not want to tolerate the other party, or they don't want to tolerate. Minority races. Mm -hmm. That's that's. Uh, 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 Donald Trump has a very low tolerance ratio. He does not like blacks. He does not like Hispanics. He does not like women. He's going for the white middle class, whether they're male or female. No. Uh, and some people call that Donald Trump would dispute everything you just said, right? All right. What would Donald Trump say? Well, Let me he, hear Donald would, Trump. he would say, "Look at how many women I have hired and are yeah. in corporate positions. Were they getting how many wage? minorities yeah, he has yeah, working yeah, yeah. for okay. him?" Uh, I'm, you know, yeah. I'm not defending Donald Trump, but I'm just saying he would just dispute what you said. Just said he has a point of view. You know, I have yeah. a point of view. Yeah, I don't agree with Trump. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, David, if you want to, well, I think that put your two cents <clears throat> in here. I think that uh, the important thing for me and the important thing to recognize, no matter how you want to factional, factionalize the groups that we're talking about, the important thing is that we're all treated equally under the law. And I think that that's right. what people are asking for, equal right. rights, equal protection under the law, which is enshrined in our uh, Constitution in the and, amendments. And I don't think that's too much to ask. I don't think it? it's too much to ask either. And I think that part of the problem is that when you start to divide people amongst these different subgroups and you start to fractionalize people, uh, you lose sight of what the main problem is to me, and that is the enormous uh, class disparity that exists in America. And I don't think, I think Americans for some reason have a, a strong aversion to talking about class as such. You don't hear a lot of discussions about class. It, maybe it smacks too much of Marxism or whatever it might be, but that seems to always be a shoot, was not a legitimate part of the discussion. But when we are, when we're at a point now in American history where the second Gilded Age, which we're in now, has surpassed the first Gilded Age, 
in terms of wealth inequality, in terms of income inequality, when we have the richest nation on the history of civilization and you have this enormous discrepancy between the top one-tenth of one percent and the rest of us, and you see over the past 40 years this enormous shift in wealth upward from the middle class to the ruling class, the elite wealthy interests, and you have a president-elect who has appointed the richest cabinet in history, full of billionaires and millionaires, I think that the time now is to talk about class in America, mm -hmm. to talk about these wealth and income inequality, uh, to, to stop dividing ourselves and factionalizing ourselves amongst race and religion and, and orientation. Yeah. I think that with the people, the working people of this country really need to unite in what is their best right. interest and that is a, a firm economic stance for their own standard of living and well-being. I, I uh, agree with 100% of what they just said. I was getting said. ready to say <laughs> that. I, 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 can't, I don't think there's anybody watching this program that would dispute what you just said and you put it very well. Um, yeah, that's... Uh, you ought to put that in the A news. Okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, Robert, you want to comment on that? I mean, you know, I mean, you. Well, well obviously, you know the I, history. I, I would guess you're in agreement with what he just yeah, said. The that only was problem is, what, is this question of sexuality, and I will just say, what individuals do after they're 18 is their own private affairs. Yeah. But as a married man with children, and traditionally. Catholics and Protestants and Jews did not encourage their children to get into homosexual activity. That is the business of entertainment. It's Hollywood that's interested in that issue. The theater group in, in New York, Greenwich Village. You're saying that's not a political issue. Well, it became a political if issue. It did, yet that should it be. Well, I can't censor the world. No, you can't. I'm just saying uh, 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 the, the Hillary and I'm just saying in one word, Hillary and Trump had too much to say about people's sexual behavior and some people voted against both of them yeah. for being obsessed with sexuality. <laughs> I would like to ask you a question historically, yeah. Yeah, uh, kind of reverting back to what I was talking about how we are in the second Gilded Age. Now in the first Gilded Age, we had the robber barons of the 19th century. Right. We had uh, enormous wealth and income inequality. We had an activist conservative Supreme Court. That's right. Led by uh, 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 the Fillmore. Not Fillmore. Um, uh, his name's slipping me right now. Fuller, the Fuller Court, the Melville Fuller Court. Okay, Fuller. Yes, um, he was so, a conservative. So the prospect of what the Trump and the Republicans are wanting to do now, they want to make, they, the Texas Republican congressman came up with this plan to drastically cut Social Security. Right. They want to voucherize Medicare. Right. They want to block grant Medicaid to the states. They want to roll back, from my point of view, the 20th century, all the True. social gains. They want to roll the New back Deal, the New Deal, yep, right. The Great you, Society. Right. They want to put us back, to me, what it seemed, they want the conservative activist Supreme Court. They seem to me to want to put us back into the 19th century. Right. As a historian, what parallels do you see? Parallels? Well, the, 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 from what I'm saying, do you it's, see, do it's you agree? Un it's unprecedented, it's unprecedented. Democracy is gradually getting weaker and capitalism is gradually getting stronger and that's why I belong to a private club called Democracy Over Corporations and I think we should have a 28th Amendment which says that a corporation is defined by the law and a person is defined in the Bill of Rights as a human being with two ears, two eyes and persons have civil rights and corporations should not enjoy civil rights and they shouldn't be censoring uh, private individuals under the uh, uh, amendments of the Constitution. The amendments of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights is to protect individuals against government power. And now we have corporate power. The corporation grew informally well after the Civil War. They had a corporation in, in, in Washington's day, but it was a very limited corporation. It consisted of the first bank of the United States. 
they had the right to uh, coin money. But you didn't have the Pennsylvania Railway. You didn't have the Standard Oil. By the turn of the century, by, this is the first Gilded Age, by 1900, corporate power was gradually eliminating small business. And my father was a small businessman who owned his own truck. He was a driver operator. That business is unavailable today. If you're going to drive a tractor trailer, you've got to work for a huge company and get a salary. <laughs> True, yeah. And eventually, I mean, to, with automated cars now, they might uh, put drivers out of you, business altogether. Uber. They're going to get rid of the taxi drivers. Right. <laughs> now, it, well, here's another way to look at it. In, the, in the, for the first Gilded Age and the robber barons of the 19th century and the conservative activist Supreme Court that was striking down child labor laws, right. this gave us the first progressive era. Uh, this gave us people like Eugene Debs and, and right. John yeah. Lewis right. and, in 19, and Mother Jones and the rest, right? Yeah, about 1890, you have the progressive movement. And that led to both Woodrow Wilson and uh, Teddy Roosevelt. And it led to the beginning of unions. The AFL was established in Columbus in 1887, and then Grover Cleveland was elected, and he recognized a Labor Day, 1st of September, but he didn't want it on uh, in July. He didn't want it to celebrate the Haymarket uh, Oh, right, the uh, Haymarket, riot, yeah. Because that became the holiday for the International Socialist Movement. <laughs> and May Day is celebrated in Spain and in France, and in Russia, but only the United States has a Labor Day in September in order to divide the working class. So uh, Grover Cleveland was a, was a relatively conservative Democrat compared to where Europe was moving. He was a bourbon Democrat, wasn't he? Was well, he, he was the mayor of Cleveland. Democrat? He was right. the mayor of Cleveland. This was an urban city, not Cleveland, uh, Buffalo. Right. He was the mayor of Buffalo, New York. And the urban working class, Irish, from, uh, Ar uh, from Ireland, were working as cops and uh, firemen in Boston, New York, and in Buffalo, which was the second largest city. And the working class was gradually getting organized as plumbers union, as a craft union, as a, as a carpenters union. And the railroad workers were the first ones to organize, and there was United Brotherhood of Railroad Workers. But the AFL was a rather conservative union in the fact that they divided it into locals for craft. And when the plumbers went out on strike, the carpenters kept on working. Well, under Roosevelt, you had a new organization called the CIO and the United Mine Workers and the United Automobile Workers, and they set up the idea of an industrial union. When Ford Motor Company goes on strike, everybody goes on strike, regardless of your profession, and you close the plant down. That's more effective. That was called the general strike. Mm -hmm. And uh, that gave uh, organized labor new powers that they never had before, and they have been whittled away since Roosevelt's death. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. certainly. So it's the present power of corporations is bigger than the first Gilded Age. I oh, think yeah. The, I think the so-called first Gilded Age second is a, is a euphemism to hide up the power of corporations. Oh, because it's so much worse now. It's worse, yeah. it's worse than the original. Yeah. Now, it's worth remembering, too, that it, this, this was during what the academics call the fourth party system in American politics. But political parties weren't aligned like they were today between conservatives on one side and progressives on the other. There were conservatives and progressives in both sides, right? So Teddy Roosevelt, the Roosevelt, I caught myself that time. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he, that's, he that's ran as a progressive. History, yeah. <laughs> he, he ran as a progressive. Right. But like the political parties themselves were much more aligned around ethnicity, religion, now, what do you mean uh, by urban. ethnicity? That's I, a new issue. I'm talking about, like, you were talking about the Irish uh, uh, laborers, for instance. Yeah, um, but that was an underground issue. Right. You see, the in, in, uh, people in Boston, the cops and the, and the uh, firemen, 
called the Yankees the original inheritance of the Puritans. Now, okay, Boston, yeah. the Yankees move out and they go to suburbia and they go to Western Massachusetts and they go to Oregon. Mm -hmm. So the original Puritans are no longer very powerful in Massachusetts. It's majority Roman Catholic in theory. Although the Roman Catholics are getting more liberal now since John Kennedy. Right. So liberalism is, and progressivism. And goes Pope on. Francis. Yeah, right. And Pope John the Twenty Third, the most radical pope in 500 years. Yeah, and he didn't last very long, did he? That was well, the there was a kind of a conservative backlash with Paul I and Paul II and John Paul and, mm -hmm. and Benedict the Fifteenth. They wanted to hold the line, but... Uh, the Roman Catholic Church has world interests. Now, this, this is the ethnicity problem. Uh, the United States had a wave of immigrants, first generation. First came the English, then came the Scots-Irish, then came the Germans and the Dutch. And only do the Germans and the Dutch get into political power in the next succeeding Generations. Right, yeah. The first Dutch president was the eighth president, Martin Van Buren. Van Buren, right. Because the Dutch settlers in New York were just as old as, and even older than the English in that. Yeah, it was originally the New Netherlands. Right, and, and York that's took my, it That's when the DeWitts came. Yeah, so they had a mixed group in New York. And then New York City became the, uh, you know, the Statue of Liberty and the great port of entry. Mm-hmm. So uh, the Irish, the Hungarians, the Jews, uh, everybody came from Eastern Europe. They entered through New York, and then they spread out into and, Chicago. And that, that immigration created a great backlash at that time as well, right, with the nativist party? That was, yeah, about the, the time of Abraham Lincoln. The know-nothings. Yeah, the, but yeah. that didn't last because the Civil War overtook that. Right. And the know-nothing party disappeared in the 1860 election. Right. And it became North versus South. <laughs> And they were Anglo-Saxon and Protestant on both sides. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it was over the black question. The status of the black man, should he remain a slave, yes or no? Well, the North, the Massachusetts, Maine, Ohio won mm -hmm. in a close battle. Okay. And then we had Reconstruction, in which gradually the Southern whites come back into the Federal Union but they want to keep segregation in those southern states, and we had the white primary. Well, yeah. And then we had World War II. Now, World War II gets us to foreign policy, and Adolf Hitler was the most anti-Semitic, racist European they ever had in history, and he lost the World War, World War II. Well, that has a an implication on the United States because they put the Nazis and the Germans on trial for war crimes. But the Americans were the judges, the French were the judges, the Soviets were the judges. And one of the guilty uh, pleas that the Germans had to plea after the trial was over would say to the American prosecutor, well, you don't like the way we treat Jews, but how are you treating whites in the South? I mean, how are the whites treating the blacks in the South? So that led to a kind of a reevaluation of racism in America. And we had Martin Luther King. The Civil Rights Movement of and the 50s and 60s. And before that, we had a great writer called uh, Gunnar Myrtle. Mm -hmm. In 1944, talked about the American Dilemma. And he saw, oh, the yeah, yeah. he saw the connection between European Nazi racism and what's going to happen in the United States. And he says, well, the United States has got to reform itself. And the British Empire has to reform itself. Oh, and, that was and the South time Africa, of enormous transition. Yeah, yeah. yeah, South Africa. You can't have a white minority preserving itself forever. The apartheid, right. Yeah, it's, gonna, it's going to erode away. So... Ethnicity is a post-World War II debate. Can I yeah, go pause ahead. here? Um, we should probably take a station break. Yeah, very good. Um, well, we, <clears throat> we've been debating uh, without our moderator, who had to leave on an errand. So we're trying to keep the clock balanced between Dave DeWitt, 
who is a journalist from the Athens News, and I, as a historian, see uh, history as a teacher of politicians. I am a retired historian from Ohio University, and my name is Robert Whaley, and I'm trying to uh, use history to inform journalism that they should take history seriously for the future of the United States democracy, and it seems to be in some doubt with the election of Trump. You know, sometimes I wonder about that philosophically as a journalist. Um, sometimes it seems to me that the, uh, the American public could use a remedial course in history sure and uh, constitutional concepts, right. perhaps now more than ever, um, That's right. such as the things that I was talking about earlier, uh, ideas, simple, straightforward ideas of right. being treated equally under the law right. and right. before the law and, right. and the rights that we do have uh, right. given to us in our, in our Constitution, but not given to us by the government. The, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence makes very clear that these are natural rights that That's we're right. afforded by right. providence, not right. by the laws of man. And the, the, these documents were created right. to protect them and to protect us, not to afford us these things. And what we, we have own them naturally as human beings. That's kind of the philosophy behind it. So as a journalist, sometimes I wonder, Perhaps I should do more column writing to explain some of this stuff or something. Well, uh, a good journalist discovers history. Uh, this is what happened to George Orwell. One of my favorites. Uh, he started out as a writer. He started out wanting to write fiction. So, but he had a historical background because he had to live through the First World War. And he discovered at the end of the First World War the significance of Karl Marx and socialism. And he repudiated his father, who was an imperialist for the British Empire, and went to Burma and wrote a book called Burmese Days, in which he, he decided to get out of the British Empire and go back to England and write novels about the working class. And his first book was down and out in London and Paris in the Depression. And he got as a advisor a woman by the name of Mabel Fierres, a uh, member of the uh, Labor Party, the British Labor Party, who said, well, you can get this edited by a left-wing publisher, the left-wing left book club mm -hmm. written by Victor Golans. Oh, okay. Now, Victor Golans was collaborating with the Comintern and the Soviet Union and said, well, the next war is going to be uh, against fascism. So they had a, a program called the United Front, which became the Popular Front, and that led Orwell into the Spanish Civil War. And he gradually saw that, uh, well, he first saw that, that, that uh, fascism was the enemy. But as he got into Spain, he saw it was complicated. And he saw that uh, the communists under the Soviet brand were just as bad as the fascists. And he discovered the importance of propaganda. He discovered that the liberals were lying, the communists were lying, the conservatives were lying, everybody was lying. And that's where he gets the idea of Big Brother. And he could see that in Franco and Mussolini and Hitler. And then he could foretell that's going to happen with Russia, with Stalin, and Stalin could change his party line, and he came up with the idea of a dysutopia, a dysutopia. Mm -hmm. That is a tragic future in which Big Brother eliminates democracy. And unfortunately, some of the trends of, of uh, Orwell's prediction are coming to pass through technology. Through technology, capitalism grows in power. That's the problem today. And of course, Trump exploits that with cyberspace and, and YouTube and uh, all kinds of propaganda. He outruns the New York Times and the Washington Post. That is uh, a serious, news, both of them are serious newspapers, 
who have historians and journalists become historians and historians sometimes go into journalism and there's an interaction because the journalist and the historian both ask who, when, where, how, but the big question why, the historians have a larger framework. Mm -hmm. The journalist thinks of the next election, four years maybe, trying to predict the next election. The good historian doesn't predict very much except very fundamental trends. Well, I, I find interesting. There's another dystopian novel, um, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. That's correct. And in, in that dystopian universe, uh, the people, the characters take this thing called Soma. And yeah. it basically That's it's drugs. it's a yeah it's a type of drug and what he it is is it's the a Joker revolution. it's a distraction <laughs> and and I'm gonna make I, I, actually it's not even my argument it's an argument that was put forth by an academic named Neil Postman in 1984 yeah. in a phenomenal book called Amusing Ourselves to Death right. and in that book Postman argued right. that when when our when these great issues of importance to a democracy to a people. Uh, become just another form of entertainment, as right. he called it, infotainment, he coined the term. That's when the real trouble comes, uh, the real threat to culture and democracy comes. And, and I was reading, I was rereading it lately because it does seem so relevant these days, the work of Postman, uh, amusing ourselves to death, just think of that construction, everything's entertainment. And I want to read this quote from him. Um, when a population becomes distracted by trivia, Right. When cultural life is redefined as a perpetual round of entertainments, right. when serious public conversation becomes a form of baby talk, when, in short, people become an audience and their public business a vaudeville, right. then a nation finds itself at risk. Cultural death is a clear possibility. Yeah. And to me, that seems we have a reality television star as our president don't call it elect. Reality, though. <laughs> well, yeah, a reality television star. <laughs> That's a euphemism. As, oh, absolutely. Well, it's not. Fantasy. It's fake. Fan it is. Fantasy it becomes is. reality. It's just as yeah. scripted and directed as any other form of television, yeah. but it's ostensibly a... Re so we have a television star who is now our president-elect, and I think that... That's right. I think that Dangerous. this. I think that post all of Postman's predictions are coming true in That's rapid right. succession. That's right. And it's. I find it quite disturbing because... People do treat this, they, they, it seems to me, our culture is currently treating very serious public business as yet another form of in, in, entertainment. That's true. Donald Trump treated the presidential debates like he was on the Jerry Springer show. That's right. It, it's, That's I right. mean, I, I feel like Abe Lincoln had the old line after he lost the Senate race about, you know, the, the young boy who... Uh, stubbed his toe on his way oh, after that, seeing his girl. That's Stevenson. That's Stevenson. Didn't, Stevenson. didn't know whether to, uh, it, it, too, um, what, I, what, how's it go? It goes, uh, too, too old to cry and too hurt to laugh. That's, that's kind well, of I how I feel. Well, I guess Stevenson changed that a little bit. About this. Stevenson lost two races to Eisenhower in 52 and 56. Mm -hmm. And somebody asked Stevenson, well, what do you think of your uh, losses? And he said, well, it's like stubbing your toe. It hurt, but it's, you're too old to complain about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's how it I guess he got that from Abraham Lincoln. I didn't know that. Yeah. Because the, they were both from Illinois. Yeah, well, that would make but sense. I'm sure the, he was very the, familiar. I miss the uh, Lincoln uh, allusion. Yeah, the boy who stubbed his toe. Too old, too old to cry and too hurt to laugh. That's right. how I feel watching this. Right. Every well, day. I, I have that view of democracy. I, I sometimes get cynical and say, well, democracy is dying. But I don't want to say that too loudly because that will discourage young guys who are on the oh, periphery. Yeah. What is democracy? What is capitalism? What is the difference? Right. Well, if it's, if it's all a fixed game, why bother to register? Right. They give up. Well, I don't want to be a... a, a, a uh, Predicting the the end of the democratic empire, but it could happen. You got to be sure. aware of it. Could and happen here. That was a famous novel. And I think that that's <laughs> part of that's here. part of what's scary about it to me too is that you you look at history and you see things such as uh, 
you know, take, take various times in the Roman Empire where generations don't remember the wars and the hardships of previous right. generations as new generations come forth. And we're, we're at a time now where, where perhaps more, more American voters don't remember the hardships and, and the, the trials of the 20th century, and they right. don't remember the sacrifices that were given to fight for these very important things, and so they become less important. They don't, they don't perhaps recognize how much is really at stake here. Uh, right. Because they haven't seen it directly in their lifetimes yet. That's correct. And, and that's what's happened to Trump. He was born in 1946 when Truman was president. Well, what is his memory of the first of the second war, of the Second World War? Practically zero. Right. But as a real estate dealer, he didn't pay attention to this complex history that I'm trying to elaborate. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> well, he seems to have, he, he actively boasts that he doesn't read books. I mean, yeah. he doesn't, so he, he has no He's direct experience with it. That's and if the, he doesn't read books, then he has no intellectual that's right. experience of George it. George Orwell, ignorance is strength. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, yeah. There are more anti-intellectuals in the United States than in Europe. There would, it, there's certainly a backlash against intellectualism that we've seen over, I'd say, over 20 years now. Well, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a problem in the, in the foundation of the country. See, right-wing populism is anti-intellectual. Right. It came out of the South, who didn't like big banks in New York. But they didn't have any sophisticated economic training to know what caused the big banks to get richer. You've got to go to college and get a course in... Keynes and Adam Smith and uh, Karl Marx and find out how economics works. Yeah. Well, Americans are ignorant about politics, ignorant about economics, and very ignorant of philosophy because it's been too easy. The reason why Marxism didn't increase very well, much in America is that the immigrant who gets off the boat said, well, why join a union? I can get a little job out in Illinois and own my own farm in two years. I don't want to organize. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think I've, I've read some stuff about this before. Just the vastness of America's geography. Right. Allow Opportunity. Right. Allowed Go this, west, this agricultural, <laughs> yeah, Horace Greeley, this, this uh, agricultural opportunity that a lot of Europe didn't because it was constrained by its geography in certain ways. It didn't have this vast western expanse to explore. Right. Um, was that Orwell who made that point? Who was that who made that? I, I feel like I've read the point that the reason why socialism Marxism. and Marxism flourished in yeah. Europe yeah. over America was because Europe had this constrained well, one geography. Who, one of the persons who developed that is is uh, C. Wright Mills. Have you ever heard of C. Wright Mills? I don't believe so. Well, C. Wright Mills is a, an American sociologist who wrote a book in 1952, I believe, 53. I've heard about it when I went to Oxford. Even though he's an American living in New York, nobody ever quoted that in their history courses. But he calls it the power elite. And he says, well, America has a, an elite, but it's not articulated. There's an hereditary elite. If you're born on the Mayflower, mm -hmm. there is a financial elite. If you have enough money to go to Wall Street, there is a military elite. You got to go to Annapolis and, uh, West, and Point. West Point to get in, see? Mm -hmm. So he says the power elite, it's an interlocking directorate between politics, the military, and privilege, which comes from heredity, this is where the Anglo-Saxon has won up on the uh, recent immigrant from uh, uh, Romania who's got to start from the bottom and learn the English language. Mm -hmm. he's, he's two to three generations behind, see? Right. Oh, but yeah, that's, a, that's an old... Uh, so that plays into yeah. why socialism right. wasn't able to take hold that's in right. America the way... Right. right. Now, there are other writers like C. Yeah. Wright Mills that used to write about that. And when I first went to Maine, that was on the tip of the tongue of all of the 
historians. But mm -hmm. since that has passed and the Republicans have gained more power, there is less discussion of that. In other words, C. Wright Mills is not very popular today. Yeah, yeah. Well, it seems like, so. I mean, socialism is still a dirty word in America. That's right, that's right. Um, Bernie Sanders put a dent in that, I think, a little well, bit. Well, he hopes to put a dent in it, um, but he, he was sidelined by the mass media. He was, yeah. Yeah, now, whether he does anything in, in, in Vermont to revive that, I don't, I'm going to buy his memoirs. I'd like to write a review of his Oh, memoir. are they coming out now? Yeah, you can buy, well, he's, he's the memoir of the campaign. Oh, I see, okay. It's not, yeah. a, I don't think, he, I, mean, the, I doubt if, it, I don't. I didn't realize a book was forthcoming, but yeah, I would, I'll certainly I get a copy it. as well. It's, it's on, you can get it from the Ohio bookstore. Ohio book. Okay, yeah. You can get it on the internet. Yeah. But I think it's just the recent campaign. Okay. I doubt if he goes early. Well, I'm sure that'll be, and it was written by him, not... It was written, it's his memoir. Okay. It's a kind of a yeah. memoir. But you see, his weakness is this, that he, his mother was born in Poland, his father was born in Poland in 1921. So he gets assimilated in the English language a generation behind, so to speak. Now, it was his brother, older brother, who went to law school and told him, well, you better get out of New York City and go to the University of Chicago. You can get a better education. Mm -hmm. Robert, uh, yeah. where did the name Sanders come from? I think that's a pseudonym. I think it, his, it has to be. It must have been. It's, that's not Polish. Yeah, by yeah. Sooner, his name was probably Sanderowski or some yeah. such name, or his yeah. father's name. Yeah, so that's well, that's what Muskie did. Yeah. See, Muskie came from Maine, and he was in a very Anglo-Saxon place although there were a lot of French Canadians. And uh, his name was originally Muscavich, but he knew yeah. if he was going into politics, right. he would do just like the Hollywood people. Yeah. yeah. Bert Lancaster, that was not his given name. Right. right. <laughs> so he made up a, a kind of a name, Musk. Well, That's know, an old fish. I know in northern Ohio that a lot of the Polish and, and, and people, that, the Hungarians and people that come from that part of the world they were discriminated against, sure. and so the first thing they did was change their name or, or chop it in two or something, yeah. and and in that way people didn't know where they originated from, That's and right. they were more likely to get employment. And there were lots of uh, Jews with the name uh, yeah. Rubenstein and Einstein yep. who dropped that and took up yeah. some kind of an Anglo-Saxon name right. as they did in Hollywood and then went into politics. I think that Kerry is a perfect example. John Kerry it probably is, is a phony. <laughs> John Kerry's father was Jewish. Yeah. And his father said, well, you want to go into the diplomatic service? Well, he says, let's look on the map here. This is Boston, this is an Irish place. He says, let's call it Kerry, from County Kerry. There you go. And he invented that name. Yeah. And he advanced in politics. Yeah. He goes to uh, Yale, I guess, for his BA. And then he goes to Boston College, a Catholic college. Yeah. And then he becomes the Attorney General of Boston. And then he does get in the Foreign Service. Yeah. But he's a, a, you might say, a third generation Jew yeah, or it, something. <laughs> it, it definitely would be difficult to uh, you know, negotiate with uh, the Middle East with, with a Jewish name. Yeah, you know. right. Well, the Jews have changed, the, the great majority of Jews have changed their tune. Before the establishment of Israel, Jews kind of hid their identity and made up Anglo-Saxon names. Yeah. But after the establishment of Israel, the Zionists come out and said, well, you ought to be proud of your Jewish heritage and b stick it out there. And so some later Jews then, some later 20th century, 21st century Jews, say, well, I don't want to be assimilated. Yeah. I am Jew and I'm glad to be Jew and I may go to Israel someday. Well, let me tell you a little <laughs> joke on your, the Robert Whaley program here. Yeah, okay. Years ago in San Diego, I was to meet 
a person at a hotel in San Diego, this right. upscale place, and they had a security guard there. And so when I got there, she asked me what my name was, and I said it was Stephen. And she said, well, and she's got a clipboard and she's writing down names. And she said, well, what's your last name? And I thought, you know, I'm just having a meeting here in the lobby with somebody. I, I don't need to be given my name. I was just the way she went about it. So I looked at her and she said, sir, I've got to have your last name or I can't admit you to the hotel. And I said, okay, it's Goldberg. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so she goes inside and consults with another security guard and they came back out and I thought they were going to roll out the red carpet. Mr. Goldberg, right this way. All you know, I mean they ushered me into the lobby there and the people behind the desk were that's Mr. Goldberg, you know. Well, later on I found out and I pulled that name right out of the air. I found out that the owner, the new owner of that hotel was Steven Goldberg. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, I, I, it's just a little joke. But, it is a joke. But uh, names mean something sometimes, yes, that's, that's you know. True. And, but yep. anyway, okay. that's so, that. Uh, I guess we should get back to World War II, returning to the problems of World War II. Uh, that was a combination of the armies of Great Britain and its Commonwealth uh, uh, neighbors, the British Commonwealth, the United States, and occupied current countries like Hitler, who set up governments in exile in England, the Norwegians, the Poles, the Belgians, and the Dutch, and they all had exiled units who invaded France on the 6th of June. 1944, D-Day, to reconquer Europe for the West, okay? And that was one of the major victories of the Anglo-American uh, forces in World War II. So people in the United States forget that World War II was won by three powers, the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union. Most Americans pretend the Soviet Union wasn't there, that it was an American victory, a total American victory. Yeah. But That's how they don't forget you, history. Don't you think uh, <laughs> what bothers some are that we allied with the Soviet Union in order to win the war and Joseph well, Roosevelt Stalin, did that. Yeah, and Joseph Churchill Stalin, did. Yes. That's Joseph the balance Stalin of ours. Yes. Yeah, General Joseph but Churchill got the law. They, they'd like to forget about Joseph Stalin. I yeah, think. they would. That's the problem of the antipathy to Marx, Marxism, and socialism. And there was that kind of thinking. Is it maybe fascism, maybe Mussolini's fascism is the answer to communism? And this is why you had appeasement in Britain from the <laughs> uh, 1930s, and Chamberlain didn't want to go to war. He said the next war is not going to be with Germany. And Hitler pulled his wool over Chamberlain's eyes. I never understood if Neville Chamberlain really uh, realized uh, the seriousness of what was going on at the time. Well, he didn't understand. Well, you history. know, I mean, in '39 they go into Poland, and you know, it's like so what, you know, and we, well, yeah, I, you know, I read the Chamberlain papers. They're very interesting. He went to Munich, and he signs this deal with Hitler. This is Hitler's last territorial claim. This is peace with honor, peace in our time. And he really believes that, and he goes back to Britain and, and gives that publicly. Now, Churchill said, you're a fool. Hitler will tear that treaty up in six months. And Chamberlain did have to eat his hat. Yeah. Well, anyway, in his, in his letters, he says he used to write to two sisters. He has correspondence with two sisters who are widows. Yeah. One of them was, I don't know their name, but anyway, he says to one of these sisters, well, I've certainly fooled the socialists, and he meant the British socialists, the British Labor Party, yeah. because as I rode from Munich to the airport, 
I was being cheered all the way. Well, what a fool. He was taken in by Nazi propaganda, and he didn't know. He was naive yeah. because he never read the history of the balance of power. He didn't want to know anything about World War I. And what he learned from World War I is that England was bankrupt. Yeah. And he became the Chancellor of the Exchequer. That's like the Minister of Treasury. Yeah. And he used to say to all of his conservatives, Britain cannot afford for a second world war. Yeah. We haven't got the money. Yeah. We're down to two minutes, Robert. <laughs> yeah, so okay. So if you want to let David comment on that or... Well, we didn't get as far as we wanted. Anyway, go ahead, let's, let's, <laughs> let's go. We'll have to well, go that's again. That's all right. Yeah, we, we rarely do get as far as we'd like. But <laughs> we did cover a lot of ground today. We covered uh, everything from world well the election of donald trump obviously and right. related it to everything from uh the first gilded age and the robber barons of the 19th century to world right. the history of world war ii and um george orwell obviously aldous huxley and uh perhaps our dystopian future hopefully not i guess we'll see well my summary is that i wish that journalists would read more history before they get into journalism. Because literature is the favorite subject to be a journalist because they know how to manipulate words. And they become unconscious propagandists. They don't even know they're propagandists. They just use nice flowery entertainment. So uh, I go Every along. journalist with the exception of David DeWitt. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I think no. that... Uh, I think that... Uh, David does know history. Let's talk about, let's talk about uh, good journalists. Right. Uh, I think that uh, McNeil Lara, he was a Canadian. McNe yeah. McNeil. McNeil Robin was a better... Yeah. Robert McNeil was a better historian than Lara. Yeah, Jim Lara. And Lehrer was a better historian than Cronkite. Now, Cronkite starts out as a sports announcer. Yeah. And he was interested in the space technology. Yeah. Well, suddenly, yeah, we got to go. Okay. Yeah, and go. Anyway, Cron Cronkite was believed, but then he saw Tet and he changed his journalism and he became more serious. Yeah. I guess we'll have to end on that point. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Okay.